Friends, pray with me. God, open my lips so that my mouth may proclaim your praise. Friends, this past year, it has seemed that so much in our lives has been unknown. We have felt unsettled and vulnerable. We've known love and grief and loss and joy. And what is known is that we are God created and always God invited into a living relationship. We are now into the full Christmas season. Here we are on the third day of Christmas. And I wish I could give you all the things, each of you. That would be three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. That would cost something like $800 per person. And clearly, this is a Christmas tune that's about the marketplace and material gifts. And we know that the real gift of Christmas is the embodied God in the form of Jesus. And there are various depictions of the Christmas story. We listen to the Cotton Patch Gospel on Christmas Eve, Southern, Contemporary. Well, Brad McHarg sent along a stark characterization of the stable, written by Giovanni Papini, entitled The Real Stable. Jesus was born in a stable, a real stable, not the bright, airy portico which Christian painters have created for their son of David, as if ashamed that their God should have lain down in poverty and dirt. A real stable, the place where animals work for man. The poor old stable of Christ's old country is only four rough walls, a dirty pavement, and a roof of beams and slate. It's dark, reeking, and the only clean thing in it is the manger, where the owner piles hay and fodder. This is the real stable where Jesus was born. The filthiest place in the world was the first room of the only pure human ever born of woman. It's not by chance that Christ was born in a stable. What is the world but an immense stable, an earthly mess where no decorations or perfumes can hide the order? Jesus appeared one night. Amid the muck, smells and warm bodies of the animals, consider the angel's message to the shepherds, also fairly dirty, in the fields with their animals at Jesus' birth. In Luke 2, we hear, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And the Greek word translated great here is megas. So that's not just good news. It's good news of mega joy the best news that there has ever been or ever will be. What characterizes this good news is deep, everlasting joy for those who receive it. The contemporary English version renders the verse this way, good news for you, which will make everyone happy. In Isaiah 52, we hear how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness. Here, God tells us directly that our mission on earth is bringing everyone the good news of great joy. If the message we share and model at Christmas time, and for friends, Christmas is every day, all year long, if that message that we bring doesn't include joy, then it con contradicts God's direct word. The gospel offers an exchange of misery-generating separation for joy-giving righteousness provided through Jesus Christ. Joy incarnate, joy in human flesh. The gospel is joy-making. Each stanza of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel contains sentiments of true joy. Rejoice, rejoice. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits, born this happy morning. Joy and good cheer, come and cheer our spirits. Joy and good cheer are proper responses to Jesus, and our gospel is filled with gladness. In the face of this pandemic right now and loss that we've experienced, we are invited 
to come into the days, weeks, and months ahead after Christmas with a deep, God-given joy reflecting the eternal good news of God's love for us. And God's love takes so many forms. In our reading this morning, we hear the writer speak of altars to unknown gods, as to be seen in Athens or in the small villages and large cities in that area, each dedicated to an unknown god. One of these altars was seen by Paul, and with careful words, Paul makes known to them the God who was already included in their devotions, but without them knowing that it was the God of the Old Testament. And in a remarkable show of deep understanding, Paul sees the unity of humanity, all created by God, all sprung from one ancestor of one blood, and so counseled not to have several national gods, but to be united in the worship of one true living God. This was, is, and has been the good news. We are challenged in living as Christians. We're challenged. We struggle and sometimes not seeing. We grope for answers. Stuck in the muck, we do not see the light. The teaching in our reading is that though God is very near to every person, and even with many gifts given to us, we may not see due to the blindness within ourselves. And sometimes we find ourselves uncertain. We grope, we feel our way towards the acceptance of God's help that is always with us, always available to us through the eternal light. Listen to these two passages. The first one from 1 Peter. Who has called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light? And from 2 Corinthians, God commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, shine in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. You see, the point of this season, and the season that we're invited to embrace all year round, is to proclaim the good news to allow our light to shine like the stars conjoined in our night skies over the last week. The very light, perhaps, that shone 2,000 years ago shines brightly now. I love it when science and faith meet and shine brightly in the night sky. What is the proof that we don't have to go far to find God? Our own lives our own beings, our actions may serve as a living letter, proof that God is near, even more near, that God is with us and all around us and quickening us with Jesus' own life and Jesus' light inside of our lives, upholding us by the power of the Holy Spirit, sustaining us through the gospel message which is shared with the whole world as Paul wrote in Romans, their sound went all over the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. And in Mark, we hear counsel, preach the gospel to every creature. God is calling for radical life change. Merry Christmas every day. And so for your time of meditation and prayer, after hearing this message, I offer you this query. What radical life change is God asking of you? Thank you, friends.